Good evening, good afternoon, or good morning, depending on which part of the world you're joining us from. Uh, my name is Sam Nasser, and this is the Cleveland c -Sharp VB.net user group. A little bit about the group. Uh, we meet every month. The meetings are free of charge and open to the public, and we cover a variety of topics related to .NET. You can find the meeting information posted at meetup.com at the link listed at the bottom of the slide. I'd like to give a big thank you to our sponsors, uh, PostSharp and DevExpress, for sponsoring the post meeting prizes, which will be given away using the eval forms. I'd also like the, to thank the .NET Foundation for sponsoring the meetup site and NIS Technologies for sponsoring the virtual meeting space. In addition, I'd like to give a big thank you to Manning.com for providing a set of books that are available at a 35% off discount. Uh, you can find that over at Manning.com at the link listed at the bottom of the slide, and that link will be made available in chat in just a little bit. The discount code for that is MTPCLEC21. Some general information before we get started. Uh, first and foremost, please keep in mind participation is always encouraged. The only stupid question is the one not being asked. Uh, however, when not speaking, kindly ask you to mute your microphones just to avoid any background noise. At the same time, we want to keep it casual but organized, so jump in with any questions or comments at any point in time. But we want to give our speaker a chance to go through the, uh, the slides and the demos. Lastly, the presentation is being recorded and will be posted on YouTube in a few short days. And so with that, we're going to launch into our feature presentation tonight, which is .NET then and now, uh, going from version 1 to version 8. And that is going to be presented by Scott Hanselman from Microsoft. Scott is a developer, speaker, author, podcaster, and overall, overall great guy. Um, he has written code that you have used, and I would love to know specifically which one that is. And you can always find him on YouTube, TikTok, Instagram, and Mastodon. And so with that, let me turn it over to Scott. All right, cool. I've been going around and around about the right way to kind of talk about this stuff because everyone here is already a .NET developer, right? So, you know, there's some context that some people have. Some of us are old and we're here 25 years ago when it all started. And some of us are younger and maybe came in in the middle and around .NET 3, .NET 4 timeframe. Uh, it's significant to point out that one of the hallmarks of .NET is being really bad at naming stuff. We just suck at it completely. Uh, and we're going to continue to suck. So just, you know, get used to it. There was .NET 1, which nobody used. There was .NET 1.1, which was super popular. That was where it really started. So .NET 1.1 was one of those versions. I think it came out in 2003, uh, 2002, 2003. And it was really the version that made people go, OK, we'll forget that one ever existed. Then .NET 2 came out, which was super awesome, also great and popular. And then things went off the rails. 3, 3.5, 3.5 SP1. I don't know why that one ended up being the one that was super popular. And then everyone forgot that these ones existed, which I thought was funny. One of the things that was weird about .NET 351 uh, back in you know, 2006-ish was uh, it was a lie because it was using the CLR or the common language runtime from .NET 2. So all it was was .NET 2 plus WPF plus WCF plus a bunch of W star F stuff. .NET 4 was awesome. And then a bunch of stuff happened, you know, 0 0.1, 0 0.2, 0 0.3, 0 0.4.5, until we ended up on 4.8. And then things started slowing down. This is the one that is done. .NET 4.8 is the .NET framework 4.8, and it's done. People will say, oh, it's dead. It's not dead. It can't die. Even Visual Basic 3 is not dead. And the reason is, is Visual Basic 3 still ships with a runtime inside of Windows. You can still run your VB6 apps, your VB3 apps. You can run VisiCalc on Windows if you want to. You can run 30, 40 year old applications on Windows. So is .NET Framework 8 done? No, there's lots of people working on it every day, being thought about. A lot of cool features have been added, uh, but it moves slowly. And this is important because it ships with Windows. Now. Simultaneous to all of this stuff, we came out with .NET Core, and it made it was called .NET Core because it was like the core pared down piece of .NET, and .NET Core 1.0. Does anyone know where that actually came from? Do you know where the core of .NET Core came from, my friends? 
That's where Mono? It from. Oh, oh, it came from Silverlight. Silver yep. <laughs> yep, the core part of it, the, 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 the part because Silverlight was cross-platform. So when it came time to go and say we need a cross-platform thing, we could do Mono, which was a open source re-implementation of the .NET framework here, or we could pick the one that we understood the provenance of. Later though, because then we bought Xamarin, uh, we started pulling mono features in. So like .NET AOT, we'll talk about a little later, the ahead of time compilation features in .NET 8 do have provenance inside of mono. So there's this kind of squishy Venn diagram, but .NET Core 1 started in Silverlight first, not in mono. Mono continued to exist though. So then you got .NET Core 2 and then 3. And then do we come out with a .NET 4? No, because that would make no sense because we needed something that was bigger than 4.8. So now we have .NET 5. Why? Because it's bigger than 4.8. Oops, bigger than 4.8. At this point then you kind of draw a hard line and you pretend that everything above that line doesn't exist anymore. So that means .NET 1, 2, 3, .NET Core 1, 2, 3, they are, they're done. So now we have .NET Framework 4.8 that ships with Windows, and we have .NET 5, 6, 7, 8 every November, okay? And then we alternate LTS and standard, right? So it's short-term or standard-term and long-term support. So if we pop over to the .NET website, which I will pull up over here, Go to dot.net, pause for effect, download all .NET versions. We can see here that your even numbered .NETs have long-term support and your odd numbered ones have standard term support. And the whole point here is that the world ships yearly. Ubuntu ships yearly, Windows ships yearly, Node ships yearly. We are just trying to snap to the way that folks are doing stuff. They usually announce something in April and then ship in November. So we've been shipping every November consistently for now, what, four years. So you can count on .NET 8 coming out in November, and you can count on it having long-term support. But .NET 6 will, in fact, overlap it. So you have that couple of years where you have two things in support at the same time you'll have .NET 8 and .NET 6 in active support at the same time. So if you go and look at the .NET blog, which just put a blog post out about, I want here it is, about Bing, which uh, who would have thunk it? Bing is an, uh, a, a, a search engine people are talking about. Isn't that, isn't that crazy? Little little engine that could. Never would have, never would have guessed that uh, we're, we're Googling with Bing, my friends. Um, they went off and upgraded to .NET 5 in a hybrid mode where they, this is very clever, they built against .NET Framework 4, but they ran under .NET 5. And this is a really important thing to think about. So let's drop out to the command line and, and, and ask ourselves why that's interesting. So we pop out here and we'll go and we'll say, make your Cleveland. And feel free, if you have any questions, throw them out in the um, chat. Uh, Eli's got a question, long-term and standard-term support. How long does it last? Long-term is three years. Standard-term is 18 months. Good question. All right. Go into the Cleveland folder, .NET new console. Cool, .NET build. Oops, spelled poorly. Using a preview version, I'm using .NET 7 here. Uh, and if we go and say .NET publish, I'm going to go down into here. And I've got this executable and i got this DLL. DLL is suspiciously small, the executable is suspiciously larger. Then, we're going to want to run a thing called ildasm. I'm going to rock, drop out to the command prompt because I don't know how to do this in uh, PowerShell. And I'm going to say dir ildasm.exe slash s because I can't remember where it goes. And I'm just connecting my mouth to my head here so you can think what to see what I'm thinking. 
I, I always have to bring up the Visual Studio shell to, to run it. I don't know yeah, why. Yeah, I think it's actually even over here. I can never remember how to do dir slash s on. Um, there you go. Deep, deep in the machine. Go all the way down here. And then I'm going to just go cd. And then I will go and say start dot, which will fire up Explorer. And Ildasm will be right here. We're going deep into the past, my friends. They bring it back, close this up. Now, PWD for print working directory. We are in the Cleveland publish folder. Right click to copy, switch back to Ildasm, Control O, paste, Cleveland DLL, double click, double click, beep, 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 pull this over, marble in the fonts, zoom in. And then think to yourself, why didn't Scott use one of the 15 different open source reflector based uh, disassembly tools that are available? I didn't need to. I had Ildasm. So that's why. But yeah, there's, uh, there's lots of great tools like Just Decompile and things like that. So feel free to use whatever makes you happy. In here, we see the intermediate language. What's cool about this is that there's nothing here that says Windows. There's nothing here that says Linux. Even with .NET 1 20 years ago, there's nothing in .NET that ever said, I'm talking about Windows. So we set ourselves up for success there. And that's why, to Eli's point earlier, Mono worked. I can take that right there. And if I have Mono on this machine, let me see if I actually do. Do I have Mono? Mono. I do not. Do I have Mono over here? I do not. If I installed Mono, I could say Mono Cleveland.dll and it would work. Okay. I should be able to right now say .NET Cleveland DLL and have it work, which then makes you wonder what's the executable for, right? The uh, and if anyone's got, I'm going to go ahead and mute a few folks here. Let's go ahead and mute our friends. Uh, Jeff, we can hear you, so mute yourself, or maybe um, you can mute. Him. Thank you so much. So Cleveland.exe is actually .NET.exe. It's a stub. It's a version of that that lets me go and run that. The real brains are inside of the DLL. This is just the bootstrapper. This is the application host for the thing. All right. What's interesting about it, though, is that I could go back and create and compile a hello world on .NET 2 or 1 or whatever and run it under this. So back to Bing. It's clever. They built against Framework 4 and ran under .NET 5. That allowed their internal partner to deal with backward compatibility, but they could take advantage of the new runtime. So then when they upgraded to .NET 6, they went over to multi-targeting, excuse me, multi-targeting. So what they're doing is they're keeping their finger on the .NET chess piece looking around the board before they make that move because you got your finger on the piece it's okay you're not going to hurt yourself then after two releases once they felt confident that they're not going to take bing down they said all right we've done .NET 5 we've done .NET 6 we are now fully .NET core .NET proper whatever we're calling it and now when they move to .NET 6 everything is cool does that make sense all right, hang on. My son's coming to the front door. I want to make sure he's not locked out. All right, he's good. Um, so here they said when moving off of the .NET framework now, the move to .NET 6, meaning from a standard term to a long-term support, would be easier. And it was. There's always a little thing, a little bug here, a little bug there. What's cool about it, if you look at the, the Bing... Um, uh, performance graphs, you can guess where's the moment that they upgraded. Isn't that crazy? These are not fake graphs. They're just literally copy pasted right off of the get off of the the, uh, the Bing stuff. Here's uh, time spent in GC from uh, .NET 6 to .NET 7. There's the moment that they switched uh, core time per workflow, right? So they're dropping huge efficiency gains and they're already now working on .NET. So the point here is you want to have a workflow where, oh, God, got to do another .NET. This is going to suck. Isn't the point, right? You can have parallel builds, be testing them out. 
I have Hanselman.com and I have staging.hanselman.com. I run .NET 6 on one, .NET 7 on the other. You slowly move traffic between them. If you want to take a build every year, that's cool. If you don't, then chill. Chill out for two or three years and don't sweat it. And uh, it'll still be okay when you make it happen. And the reminder here that once you've got this in IL, we can start doing really interesting stuff. We've got .NET in, um, uh, within the form of Blazor, right? We have, we'll show, we'll look at a Blazor application in a minute here where we're actually running it in WebAssembly, but we're shipping IL, shipping DLLs over to uh, the local machine and then running a VM within a VM, which is kind of insane. Now back to this Cleveland situation here, where is .NET? Do I have to have .NET installed at this point here? Well, the runtime is actually elsewhere, which is kind of problematic if I want to make an application that's portable. If I say .NET dash info, you can see that I've got three, six, a preview of six and seven all running on the same machine You can see the exact folders that they're in. Now I got a bunch of runtimes. The runtimes are all of the supporting libraries. And then you'll notice that if we go back to our top level folder here, I've updated my prompt here using a tool called Oh My Posh. Oh My Posh. That's managing my prompt. So I've got my current folder, a emoji of a human heart, because why not? Um, that's actually whether or not the last uh, command failed or not. The human heart turns red if I get an error level one. The current version of the .NET framework in this folder and my blood sugar because I'm a type one diabetic. So I have to keep track of my blood sugar. And then if I go get init, now I have my blood sugar, my git branch, how many, uh, applic how many things have not been ch checked in and the current version of .NET, which means then I could go do something like .NET new global JSON, open that notepad, that's the version of the SDK that we're using right now. Scroll back up, maybe grab this one, six point whatever. Drop it in here, save it. Now this folder is thinking about .NET 6. I'm showing you that because I want you to be feeling very comfortable and very flexible that this is not the kind of situation that it was 15 years ago where it's like, ah, I installed .NET and I messed my computer up and everything's all, my yeah. And now I have to upgrade have as many as you want, you have them all over the place, you can have local ones or not. So back to, I'm gonna go ahead and delete global JSON and watch what happens. Now we're back to seven, okay? Now if we go back down into publish and we see this here, cleveland.exe, there's still that .NET runtime living somewhere else. So if I handed you these two files and said, hey, go and run those, they would work if you had .NET on your machine and you had to, you'd installed that runtime. Let's make it so we don't have to do that. Which.net? Uh, exactly. Ah. <laughs> Who's on first? Uh, you would have to have, in this case, because I targeted seven, you'd have to have seven, unless I targeted a lower number, like five, and then it would work on six or seven or five. Anywhere up. Exactly. Let's go and say .net publish. Um, and then we'll say self-contained. Hey, Scott, are you going to get to the difference between the SDK versions and the runtime versions? Sure, if you want. I'm happy to do that. I'm easy. I mean, I, I mean that's a good I mean, question. Let's do it. Let's list of SDKs it. and a list of runtime stuff. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sure. So, so his point here is if I just run .NET by itself, it's saying this is .NET 7. Okay. If I decided to go into, say, push working directory and I'll just move over to, like, my desktop. And I'll run .NET dash dash version. The latest version of .NET that I have on my machine is 7. If I created an app now, it'd be a 7 app. If I compiled an app now, it would be targeting 7. Only because that's the uh, what the project it would create would end up with. So I go pop D. I always like to show little spicy things, a little command line tricks that the young people maybe don't know about. Push D and pop D much cooler ways to change directories. You push it onto the stack, you push it onto the stack, push it on the stack, run all over anywhere you want, and then go pop, 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 go right back to where you were. It's 
It's much more reliable if you're writing PowerShell scripts or batch files and things like that than just CD. You'll notice also I have a predictor down here with a history. All of that's on my blog and my YouTube. So you too can have a fun looking uh, prompt here. This is all just PowerShell. I don't have any fancy stuff installed, it's just PowerShell. And I also use a thing called Z, uh, which allows me to just type things like that and hit tab and it auto-completes. I've got that on my blog as well. Okay, so let's go back in here. Look at that csproj file. Let's go and open that csproj using a tool called bat, which is like cat, but it's cooler because it's bat. Bats are cooler than cats. Uh, and it colors the output and puts a number there on the side. So here, the project that was created by the SDK, to Eli's point, is a Net7 application. So it is targeting Net7, and that's how it's... But now I could go in here, could totally go in here and say Notepad, blah, 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 change target framework to Net6 and compile it with 7. That's fine. Right. So the point is that that Eli is making, that's a good thing to remember, is that you, we, your target system, whether it be .NET 6 on Linux or .NET 7 on Windows or .NET whatever, that's expressed by this target framework. And that's, but you can build anything with the other versions. That global JSON feature that I showed you there is if you find that something broke in the SDK and you don't want to use it, then you can always go back because it's always on your machine and available. So you've got lots and lots of choice. I think we did the publish, didn't we? Self-contained. I'll do it again because why not? And we'll go back down here. Right click, CD, Control V. <gasps> what? What's this about? Now oh, again. Oh, I guess I can't do dir slash w on PowerShell. Look at all that. Well, you asked for it, right? It's self-contained. Isn't that exciting? Right? It's a self-contained build. So what it did is it copied all of .NET into that folder. Again, not .NET Framework, not the 2GIG Framework. It copied all .NET Core specifically. But here's the question, though. I see Win32. I see Visual Basic. I see System.Security, System.XML. I don't remember using XML. I just did Console.WriteLine. So I don't need these. Why did it bring them along? Well, because I didn't say not to bring them along. I just said Publish self-contained. What I want to do is I want to do some tree trimming. I want to do some tree trimming. You take your tree, flip it upside down, and you shake it really hard, and you have all the leaves that are loose that you don't need to fall off the bottom of the tree. You take a tree of all of the methods that you're calling, all of the assemblies that are getting loaded up, a transitive closure of the tree of dependencies of your system and you shake anything that's loose off so that you don't see those things. So if we go back over to the GitHub folder, I think I made a one called uh, trimmed, do, uh, I think I called it trim console, wrong computer. This is another computer on my desk behind me. Trim console, there we go. What's different in this one here? I'll show you the ZX Spectrum thing too later if you want. All I did was add this, publish trimmed, okay? So now, we go into bin, debug, yada, yada, yada. That's the everything pile. And then we can trim it all down into nothing. We can actually go and learn about that stuff. We can go and say publish trimmed. Let's switch. Actually, let's do this. We'll switch away from the... Uh, other machine that I was on, and we'll try to do it from scratch ourselves. Publish trim.net7. Trim self contained apps. Blah, blah, blah. Publish trimmed equals true. Back over here. We were inside of the Cleveland. Here. We're publishing for Windows, Win64. 
Uh, and they're saying I forgot to add dash dash self contained. So it's self contained. Now, as soon as we declare that we're self contained, we have to pick an operating system. Is it for Linux? Is it for Windows? Is it for, for Mac? So we had to pick one. That was important. So now let's go and look at that. If I type in start, look what got trimmed out. Basically everything, right? We have just the little bits we need. We call system.console. The compression stuff is needed to unpack some DLLs. We have the actual jitter itself, the garbage collector. And suddenly we went from a pile of stuff in a folder that was overwhelming to just 17 megs of things, which is not too bad. Now, yes, it's hello world, but there's a lot of stuff coming along. If I was making a microservice or a website, I would still only be like, you know, 15, 20, 15, 20 megs. Okay. Now I want to do single executable. So I can even have less. So let's try to do publish single file self-contain and include the runtime identifier all at the same time. So we're going to go back here to the Cleveland thing. And I know I'm using Notepad. People hate it when I use Notepad. Maybe I need to use Vim. They won't judge me for being. I don't have Vim installed. <laughs> I'll go back over here. I could use VS Code. I just like to drive stick shift sometimes because I like to remind people that stick shift exists. Um, I want to point out to all of our, any of our new friends or earlier in career people who might see me driving stick shift and think it's a little aggressive. It's not meant to be weird or gatekeepy or anything like that. What I'm meaning to do is have you not feel like I'm hiding anything from you. Every single thing that I'm doing can be done in Visual Studio from a menu. What's nice about occasionally driving stick shift when you're usually an Uber writer, is just a reminder that these things are underneath. And uh, when you right click and hit publish in Visual Studio, you're really just making these changes. So if I go into Visual Studio right now and say right click publish, pull from the drop downs, pick versions and stuff, it's going to make these changes. Does that make sense? Feel free to uh, say stuff in the uh, in the chat if it's helpful or not. When you nod, I feel better. Okay, la 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 la. Optimizing assemblies for size. I like that. Yes, uh, Joe is pointing out that that even though you don't have to do it by hand, it's nice to be able to do it by hand. Look at that. Look at that beautiful thing right there. So we got about 100 and, what is that? How many megs is that? 11 megs? So 11 and a half megs, single executable. Run it. Let's do it. Let's do a scale test. You want to do a load test? There you go. That's a nice fast load test. So that was a joke. Usually kills in person. That's fine. So in this case here, I could go and hand someone that cleveland.exe and now I can make executables and use them as utilities and no one needs to know or care. So that's a really powerful thing. Now this is just a console app. I can then ship my web app that way. I can ship my microservice that way. These, uh, the idea of deploying a .NET app doesn't become such a big deal. Now there was an app many, many years ago called Baby Smash. Baby Smash was a game that I made for my baby where he could smash the keyboard and it would put shapes up on the screen and it would spin and it would talk and go baby smash and it would read words to him. And it was done in WPF and I had a whole bunch of options and stuff. And uh, even today, people send me $8 uh, for donations. It's totally free and open source. Uh, the baby is now 17 and doing college tours. So I have this .NET 3.5 SP1 WPF application. We can go and say migrate baby smash. And we went and converted it. Where's the .NET blog on that? Here we go. Right. So converting an app, it was 13 at the time, 17 now, into a self-contained .NET 5 application using a thing. This is, the, this is not my baby. This is some other random baby. People send me random pictures of their babies playing uh, multi-monitor, multiplayer uh, Baby Smash. It's pretty cool. So basically, you can go and run the .NET migration tool, .NET migration. I think it's the .NET migration assistant. I guess they call it the upgrade assistant now. 
And what's cool about it is that it supports all these different kinds of applications. And it will basically interview you step by step about your app, make changes and back stuff up at every point, and help you move forward. There's two versions. You can run it at the command line, or it's now built into newer versions of Visual Studio itself. So if you actually open an old app in VS, there's a visual upgrade assistant that you can get. It's basically a, uh, a VSIX, a VSIX. So if we say .NET Upgrade Assistant Visual Studio, Here we go. There's a whole talk on it, guided step-by-step -step experience, multiple projects supported. So we converted this 13-year, now 17-year-old application, which meant that my installer can go from a uh, click once or an actual Wix installer or Wise installer to just, here's a USB key, double click, baby smash.exe, no additional supporting stuff. That's super cool. If I wanted to then compile this application, not for Windows, but rather for Linux, I would just say Linux x64. And then things start getting really interesting because then I can go and compile it for Linux on ARM, deploy to a Raspberry Pi Kubernetes server. And what's cool about that is that as someone who has hitched his wagon to the .NET ecosystem for my you know 20 years of my career, and I'm like, oh, you know, I'm just an aging .NET developer. Well, I'm actually a modern cloud native developer who's deploying cross-platform applications in Linux containers on ARM systems that didn't exist before. And that's really like exciting to me to be able to do that. And the C Sharp language and the tooling is the same and works the same everywhere. Anyone have any comments on that? Do you need to? Oh, if you need a uh, DJ8 says, if you need to move a .NET 6 app to .NET 7, is it easier to do it manually or use the upgrade assistant? That's a freaking awesome question. Honestly, it's easier just to change it like this and then compile and see what breaks. Because it's small changes from 5, 6, and 7, you'll get a compiler error. You'll go and read in the known issues, and you'll just go, oh, okay, they changed that API, or this thing has changed. The big change, the big, huge, like, what's going to hurt is going to be two things. Um, if you went from web forms, you're going to have some work. Uh, or if you're an MVC developer, you're going to need to learn a thing called startup.cs, which is kind of the autoexec.bat of, uh, of .NET. And it's this pipeline method. And I actually had to upgrade my own personal uh, website uh, at hanselman.com, oops, hanselman.com, which was a, uh, a, a, uh, MVC3 application, and then it became a Razor Pages app. All the Razor Pages, I just copied them over. The only thing I had to change was this startup.cs. And I actually have that code over here. I go into my Hanselman website and hit code dot. Now I'm going to open up Visual Studio Code right here. That startup.cs is this pipeline of uh, a couple of redirectors and things. Uh, and the hardest part of this whole deal was because I was moving off of IIS, off of Internet Information Server. I had a bunch of rules in an XML file for doing redirects and stuff. And I was switching from Windows and IIS and this XML file over to Linux and, uh, and Docker, and IIS isn't there. But there's a lot of intellectual property in here. Like, there's work. I don't want to have to spend forever doing that. I worked on this XML file for a very long time, but it only runs on IIS. So, in fact, there is middleware in the .NET Core ecosystem that not only takes files like this from IIS, but also ones called Mod Rewrite, if you've ever been an Apache uh, web server developer. We can absorb Mod Rewrite as well. So in doing that, I maintained this file. I didn't need to rewrite it. It works fine. I don't want to mess with it. I moved everything over. And then all the rest of the stuff just came along, the same razor pages as before. So if I show you, for example, my podcast site, which has a for loop in it that goes and says for each show in shows, which is not rocket surgery, but is interesting to look at. We can see what that looks like. Look at that. Look how clean that is. For each show and shows. 
here's my shows. And then it's got data binding, data binding. Very clean. So that gets me to that point about web forms. Uh, the Hansman website was easy. The Hansman podcast was easy. But the, um, uh, the blog was all written in web forms. And that was written, run on a system called DOS Blog, D-A-S Blog, not D-O-S, but DOS Blog, which is German for the blog. And uh, like DOS Blog, written by a German guy. Uh, and then uh, I took it over for a while, and I maintained uh, it for a very long time. And then Mark Downey, uh, who works at Microsoft, uh, who's an Englishman, took over DOS Blog, and he made DOS Blog Core. And the reason that I'm showing you that is it is a kind of living, <clears throat> breathing example of how to migrate a web form site to a non-web forms world. All he had to rewrite was that. Because it was already well factored into, you know, core runtime services, he had separation of concerns. Then he just had to think about, well, I've got all these ASPX pages. I've got all these web forms pages. What services are feeding them? And we literally went through our ASPX pages and changed our controls to little for loops like you just saw and slowly moved the templating engine in DOS blog from web forms over into razor pages. And here's a, an example of one. Uh, let me see. Here's a layout. They're not really interesting to look at. Like that would have been a web forms control. And now it's a razor call or, you know, render your scripts at the end. That would have been a web forms call. So we didn't really lose a lot. And in doing that, we gained a ton of perf. It is really significant that it cannot be overstated how much faster .NET Core is. .NET, again, I keep calling it .NET Core, .NET 5, 6, 7, 8. Each one is double digits faster. And you know how compounding interest works, right? It's been fast. Um, you know, we're looking at, you know, 8 to 10x faster than Node. Um, we are getting to the point now with AOT, with ahead of time compilation, where we are as fast as C and C++. So perf, if there's a perf issue in .NET, it's probably your for loop, not our for loop. Because uh, performance is a feature. Eli, you have a question? Yeah, I do. Um, and sorry if I missed the little... If you okay, mentioned fast. so I figured I would fast. web forms doesn't exist in the .NET core framework side of things or web forms does not exist post .NET 4.8 because Thanks. web forms Absolutely. itself was architecturally married to IIS and architecturally married to HTTP.sys, which is a low level driver inside a Windows server. And because it was so entangled in its responsibilities to port web forms over to core would be impossible. So what I am saying is take just the UI portion and do it in razor pages. What's great is that these are 15 year old DLLs that still run fine. So the runtime for DOS blog still works. And I will prove it to you by showing you an embarrassing little feature. If you want to see, let's look at the database, the DOS, the Hanselman blog database. First time ever. How embarrassing is this? Buckle up, kids. That's my blog. 20 years, 4,964 XML files in a folder. You know why that's not embarrassing? Because the file system is a perfectly reasonable database, depending on what you need your database for. It, store, it, store, it stores stuff. I can for loop over it. I can index it. I can search it. I don't ever have to worry about things getting corrupted like a database and rebuilding it. It's Those are the files. So the runtime engine that we wrote in 2005 for DOS blog was in .NET 2, now runs in .NET 6 and 7. We only had to go and change the data binding highest level. So if you have a web forms app that's a big ball of mud, yeah, you're probably screwed. If you did all your work in the code behind, you're probably screwed. But if you just did basic separation of concerns where you passed a view model up, then you're in a really great spot. And you just need to pass the view model over to something else. 
And it is awesome, Rick, because XML is awesome. And I am an old man that shakes fist at cloud, but you know, curly braces or angle brackets, it's all the same. YAML, you just can't see the curly braces and the angle. They're still there. They're just indentations. You know, it's all markup. It's all name value pairs. Hey, Scott, um, you uh, you mentioned AOT. I have a question. Yes, I got to talk about AOT. Good point. Yeah, thanks for reminding me. Thank you for that. Um, so uh, assume you have two environments, like a host and a target. A host is where you're doing your work, and the target's where you want to deploy. And those two environments are different. Like x x64 or uh, Mac, Linux, or um, ARM. Yeah, yeah. So yeah. you have these two environments. What are the things that you can't do on the host environment where you're developing that you have to take to the target environment? Is it That's only AOT or are there other things no, that you need to do there? If I understand your correct question correctly, it is the thing you can't do is run it. Right? So I can go here to Cleveland, and I can say .NET contain, and I can change Win x64 to Linux ARM. And I will compile a perfectly cromulent Raspberry Pi executable. And it will but compile. But that one is not AOT, right? I know. It's not AOT. I could AOT it. I could AOT it also. OK. But if I had the compiler tool, tool chain, is that what you're asking? Yeah, I guess I'm just wondering, um, is there is there anything you, other than running, is there anything you have to do as part of the build process in the target environment? Or can you do everything for any platform oh, from Windows? Yeah, that's a good question. I would probably, I, I don't want to be wrong and say you can do everything. Because if you stay well, in um, the .NET runtime world and you're just creating dll yeah you're fine it'll be fine you're fine because the runtime does all the yeah, work yeah, on yeah, the yeah, target yeah. system let's see if damien's around green no he's not green um i believe yeah i'm gonna have to check on that that's a great question because there's 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 source generators that are involved, those are fine, but you might need a local compiler. I don't know. I don't know. I'm feeling bad because now we're on YouTube. And I don't know. No one yeah. else here knows the answer, so I think we're I think we're oh, okay. Oh yeah. Let me let me just call Damien. Call Damien Edwards. Um it's gone through so many um like different styles, because um, if it was like it was LLVM or LVVM or whatever, I would need those that toolkit. I think what's awesome is that we can hey, even discuss this. I'm on a I'm at a user group live, and I've been asked a question that I don't know the answer to. Can I put you on speakerphone real quick? Sure. I mean, I'll talk. Okay. So when you are doing an AOT, can I? On Win I can't on Windows X64 AOT to Linux ARM because I need the native compiler toolkit. Nope, you cannot do no, you can't do that. We don't support that yet. Okay, that makes sense. All right, cool. That's what I thought. So you do need that last moment, that last uh last so mile. If you're on Windows, yeah. If you're on Windows and you want to publish to Linux or produce Linux assets that are native AOT compiled, you would use WSL. Okay, WSL, uh, or do it in inside of Docker or whatever. Or do it inside of Docker, and then within that environment, there are there are more prereqs for native AOT. You have right. to have the native uh, tool chain installed that .NET native AOT depends on. Yep, yep, gotcha. Okay, that's what I thought. Thank you, sir. Appreciate you. No problem at all. All right, bye. Right, because in that case, then you're bringing other little like you know a C runtime and all that kind of stuff and yep. all that local tooling, GCC plus and all that stuff. It, it's amazing right. that we can even do that with .NET today. Like that's a discussion we can have. And uh... oh yeah, absolutely. And a lot of that good work to Eli's point before, and he mentioned how Mono is involved. Like those people work here, and like they're thinking about that. So there's a lot of really cool AOT work. There's also some other AOT work that isn't Microsoft driven, but it's still super neat, like B flat. Uh, which is like C sharp, but it's called B flat, and uh, Mikhail is working on that. And basically, it's um, like Go style tooling for C sharp. And then here to your point, those are the 
glibc specific things that it can target, right? And you can target, you know, all kinds of weird stuff. And then he's going through all the different flavors of Linux targeting Android or whatever. And you're basically merging this ahead of time native AOT compiler. Uh, and then generating things with the native code generator. So we've got all these things available to us. We got the Rio JIT that we did a couple of years ago, uh, and he's plugging it all together. So this is, see, there's no MS build. It's all standard runtime. So that's really cool stuff. And he's all about making things small. And one of the things that's cool about Mikhail is that I think on his Twitter, he built a Windows 3.1 application using um, C Sharp, just because, like, why not? There you go. Because this gets to that point, if we, if we do a callback all the way to the beginning of the conversation when I showed you that IL, right? That's an abstract syntax tree, go nuts. Then you just need bindings, right? If somebody says system.console.writeline, who's the one taking the string? And then who's the one drawing the pixels on the screen? Who's the one thinking about um, UTF-8 and all those string manipulations? That's going to be your native system. It's going to be your native, you know, we would call them P invokes inside of Windows, or you'd be a syscall in the Linux world. So if I go here on Windows, and I decide to send click here, and I'm going to click on Ubuntu, I'm going to hold down Alt with my left thumb. I'm going to fire up Windows on the left, Ubuntu on the right, drop into the Hansel Minutes folder, running .NET 6, say .NET build, over there, and I'll say, I'll go back to over here, same time, .NET build. Then here, because I'm on Linux, I just compiled that application for Linux. And then I can do my Docker test. I can run and build in Docker as well. So I went and built a whole script here, though this is going to now go and do the same thing. So I built on Windows. I built on Linux, specifically Ubuntu. And now I'm building on a Docker container against Docker um, base images. And now we have distrolist images. We have Ubuntu chiseled images. We have Alpine images. You can go nuts, right? And what's so cool about that is that I just made the website, right? And it was an old website at that. So the level of like power that you get once you just kind of figure this little bit of tooling out is bananas. So in this example here, I'm going and doing that. I'm going to close this and I'm going to open up another folder. And while that Docker thing is doing its, doing its deal, on the right-hand side, I'll open up PowerShell. I'll come back over to Hansel Minutes, and then I'm going to hit code dot and open up VS Code and show you that I went afterwards and just made Playwright tests. Anyone using Playwright right now? You guys know about this? Remember Selenium? It's better. This is better than Selenium. So I made a little, I need to blog about this. I made a little generic web test server factory that you just pass your startup class to. And then I can go and write code like that. Just I'm going to just sit back. Just drink that in right there. Just putting the browser on puppet handles and pushing buttons. I can do it headless or not. Now, what's cool about that, I got Linux for free with .NET. I got Docker files for free with .NET. I can throw that into Docker and Playwright. I can run headless playwright tests in a Docker container and test against Chrome, Edge, and Firefox. And once it's in a Docker container, come up here, go to handsome.visualstudio.com, wait for DNS, click on the Handsome Minutes website, click on pipelines, look at a recently run pipeline. Looks like I, I need to log in. Ah, oh, you bastard. You know, let me go in here. Let's go down here. Click on jobs. Here's my playwright tests running in Azure DevOps. Awesome. Got that for free. Then I'll go to handsomeness.com, scroll to the very bottom, and I've added the current runtime version of .NET, the commit that is currently in production, and a link over to Azure DevOps so I can see that. The level of confidence that I have in what's in prod right now totally different than before. I used to live in fear of like, I got this old crusty code. I don't know what I'm going to do with. Added a couple tests, a little playwright to make sure I do some BS detection, a little smoke test action. 
Once I got it in containers, I can run it in Linux, I can run it in Windows, run it on IIS, doesn't matter, I don't care. I can fire up a copy of my website on a Raspberry Pi if I need to. I've got location transparency and the ability to be portable. And then if I'm confused, I haven't thought about this code in a couple of months, I can come down here and I can right click and say open uh, and then fire up. And there's the line of code I changed. It looked like I just changed the PS1 file in January. That's what's in prod right now. I hot. I can go portal.azure.com. And then I can go click here, handsome in its core. Configure. General settings. Boom. LTS 6. I'm chilling until 8. Not even stressed. Then, just to be a show off, I click the dashboard button. We used to fly consultants in, in suits from Cleveland to uh, to go and create dashboards like this when I was a kid. Now I've got this. And I go, oh my God, failed requests on Hansel Minutes. What's happening? I'm going to select those. I'm going to click on them, figure out what the deal is. Why do we have a failed request here? Remembering back in the day when I used to grep inside of Notepad you know, and look at text files. Looks like I've got 72 error 400s. Let's look at one of them. We'll click on that. Looks like someone is trying to post to a PHP file that doesn't exist, so it's probably a script kitty. Let's go ahead and expand that, and I'm being attacked from Holland. One more reason to hate the Dutch. Oh, the Dutch. Just kidding. Um, think about that. I'm just one person. But this feels like Hanselman International Consolidated, right? I got a dashboard that looks like a million bucks. I've got a pipeline CI CD. And if you want to be really silly, if we go over to my uh, my GitHub and look at the uh, right here. I don't need to go there because it's already linked to. I can um, go to like pull requests. And I've actually got bots sending me pull requests and dependencies change, right? Think about that. I don't have to think about, oh, a security thing came out. The bot says, hey, man, you need to update this. The bot then says, yo, there's been a new version. Here's the release notes and why you should care. Here are the changes. We ran compatibility tests or whatever. We verified it by building the pull request. It's like having an employee, and it's all free. I've shown you nothing that I had to pay for except for the Azure time and the website, which you already saw. Uh, I got like a $60 credit, so I'm doing okay there. I have a $61 credit. I really like the like, it's free, it's powerful. I feel like I'm enabled. I don't feel afraid. Um, so yeah, I'm kind of vibing right now, as the kids say. Comments, questions, thoughts? There's been a lot of that. I see like six or seven people on the main screen, but I don't know if anyone, just everyone else left. 31 people who are not on camera to put me something in the chat and tell me that you're alive and that you didn't think that this was a bad talk. There's actually a few questions in chat. I don't know if you had a chance to get to them yet. Oh, uh, how does AOT differ from JIT compilation? Just in time is just in time. Do it last possible second. Um, just in time compilation is also layered or what's called tiered compilation. So you'll actually um, get faster the faster you run and the more you learn about the computer. Uh, ahead of time is the, I'm pretty sure it's going to be Windows X80, you know, X64. I'm going to get it all done ahead of time. Um, it's also wicked fasts. Um, so it's, do I pay for it up front or do I pay for it at deployment time? Uh, AOT helps for startup. And if you know where you're going to be, you can really optimize for that. So like if you're going to run on a Raspberry Pi or in a microservice or in Kubernetes, you do an ahead of time compilation. Um, for the system that is the only one you're going to deploy to, and you say, I'm going to be Linux x64 on this thing with these characteristics, ship a single executable over inside of a tiny uh, Docker container. You don't ship the compiler. You don't ship any DLLs. You have a smaller surface area of stuff, so you're not shipping any bits that could get run if someone broke into it. So that's, uh, that's cool. Uh, Joe, is it all XML? Yes, it's all XML because it's awesome. I'm kind of non-denominational, you know what I mean? Like, I'm cool with anything. Hang on, my kid's high school is calling. Hello?
I hope he's not in right. trouble. No, no. He, uh, uh, the auto, the auto bot says, uh, you know, your son was absent from seventh period or whatever. And it's like, well, you were there for sixth and eighth. So obviously the teacher didn't see your head. So, um, I'm just going to have him fix his, uh, his attendance thing. Oh, he was running for student president and he did not win. Oh, That's where he was second period. Oh, ZX Spectrum. ZX Spectrum. There is a lovely gentleman named Jimmy in Sweden. Jimmy has a ZX Spectrum emulator that he wrote from scratch. Jimmy Angstrom wrote it from scratch in Blazor. So you can go to get his repository. I'll put it in the chat. Clone it, and you will get a ZX Spectrum emulator written bespoke in C Sharp in Blazor, and it runs in the browser. And he even has, I think, a version of like Maniac Miner. So if you're a ZX Spectrum person, great way to learn about computers, great way to learn about Blazor, super fun stuff. I don't think the website's up. I think he took the website down. But just actually, we can probably just do it right now. Uh, which one do I run? Platforms, laser. Pause for effect. Warnings, warnings, warnings. Listening on a port. Run it. Loading. Boom. Load it. There you go. That's awesome. We run that again. All right, so that's real. If I hit F11, F12 rather, I don't think, I think it's captured, it's captured the, um, it's captured the keyboard. Hang on. Trying to get into F12 tools here. Where's Dev Tools anymore? Oh, sh it cha they changed it. Control Shift I. That's stupid. What is that? Okay, so I'm going to go to Network. Hit Control R and then hit this. And I want to see. The DLLs come down. I feel like we're hiding something. Right click. Here's a little feature, by the way, in Edge people don't know about. If you're in DevTools, you can right click on the refresh button and you'll get options that you would not see if DevTools was not open, which means refresh. No, really, I'm serious. Oh, for God's sake, just refresh. There's three options there. And what I'm looking for that I'm not seeing, I see the Blazor WebAssembly script. See that. I was looking for the DLLs that happened on the command line, but they may have. That's .NET is JavaScript. That's the PNGs. There's the gamepad. I thought he would bring a DLL down. I'm going to have to go and look at his code. But anyway, check that out. It's super cool. Learn a lot about Blazor. It might be, oh, it might be running Blazor server, and that's why it's not working. Okay, that's the issue. So Blazor can run in the browser with uh, WebAssembly, where the DLLs come down. So you saw me looking for the DLLs, and they weren't there, and that would run this in the browser. And then there's Blazor server, which is a lot like Web Forms, where you're actually having a persistent connection back over Web sockets and you're making those connections, and then the ZX Spectrum running in the server. So in that context, 
uh, this is Blazor server, not Blazor client. And that's why I didn't see those DLL. Not cool. Scott, I just saw your uh, GitHub Copilot X narrated promo video. Um, oh, okay. I thought was it was on my desktop. Oh, shit. No, 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 no. Okay. Uh, this was published. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. I did that. Yeah, I did that on Tuesday. Yeah. So that has me very excited. I imagine it has some people scared. How does it make you feel? <clears throat> I'm going to turn off the screen share and then probably question whether we should publish this on YouTube. If you take an infinite number of monkeys and you give them an infinite number of typewriters and you let them slap the keyboard long enough, they will eventually write Shakespeare. That's a famous, famous quote. Um, if you train a very large language model on something and you say, hey, very large language model, what is, let's try, let's try an experiment here. I'm going to go ahead and share my screen again because I'm a poor planner. I should have not. I'm going to go to Bing. Come on, Bing. Just give me the freaking chat, dude. Where, where's your chat? Bing.com slash chat. Go away. Pick a number between between 1 and 100 inclusive. 42. Okay. Why did it pick 42? Is that a random number generator? It's not a random number generator. <laughs> not necessarily. <laughs> it's not a random number generator. It's a predictive model. Why did I guess 42? Because it's the most obvious answer. Based on training on all of the internet, if you take numbers between 0 and 100 and you ask a million people or a million web pages, they're going to pick 42 because Hitchhiker's Guide. Did, would that have worked That's before <laughs> Hitchhiker's Guide? It would not if you had trained a very large language model in the 70s. No, it wouldn't, right? It can only be based on the corpus that it sits upon. So we've trained it on the last you know, 150 years of digitized text. Everything we've ever said, everything horrible we've ever said, you know, it's the, both, it's the best of us and the worst of us, right? Um, it is a sock puppet. And if you put a sock in your hand and you're like, ah, you're alive. I'm alive. What have I done? It's alive. Well, you just told it was alive. It's going to, you're afraid of your own sock puppet here, right? So it is a predictive large language model. It is not a computer yet. It's not an AGI. It's not an, uh, it's not an um, artificial generalized intelligence. It's going to say the most likely thing. I could hit refresh again and ask it again. It'll say 42 again. Now, everyone's large language model is different, but it's not doing that. So when it tells you you should use HTTP client, you know, async, whatever, whatever, it's doing that because enough people have said that, that it's statistically likely that you should do that. Now, if somehow everyone was wrong all this time, and then next Thursday we figured it out and we want to go back and tell everyone, We'd tweet it and everyone would Google it and they'd blog it and whatever. But this large language model is is baked as of November 2021. It'll never know that it's wrong. Now then Bing, and what's cool about Bing Chat is that Bing Chat will um, look at new information, apply that new website that it just Googled with Bing five minutes ago, lay that or overlay that on top of the corpus of what it knows, plus some information I just Googled, and then it'll say, oh, I know more stuff now. Right. Um, Copilot is really interesting because it's trained not as a very large language model, but rather on this corpus of open source software plus GPT-4 plus the power of Roslyn and, and, and the Win Visual Studio and unit testing and all that kind of stuff. That's an example where we need to stop thinking that very large language models are going to be the problem to solve all problems. And they're going to be a really, really cool Swiss Army knife. Now, so I'm a big believer in the Swiss Army knife, right? The Swiss Army knife is why the Swiss Army is the power they are today. But the Swiss Army knife is a crappy pair of scissors, and it's a mediocre pair of tweezers, and it's a weird little toothpick. Uh, it's not the greatest tool ever. It's just a mediocre everything. But then you have a real custom pair of pliers and a Swiss Army knife. You can get some work done. So 
Copilot X to me represents the Copilot code corpus plus a decent GPT-4 chat model plus Roslyn compiler and things like that. So if I say generate unit tests, I'm not going to directly yeet them into production, but I'll give them a good look and I'll go, yeah, you saved me some typing. That's pretty cool. So we need to stop thinking that it's a clever HAL 5000 AI to chat with, oh, I'm being replaced. It's an Iron Man suit. And we saw when Tony Stark brought those empty Iron Man suits and called them in, they were bumbling all over the place. It's not until he gets in the suit that real cool stuff happens. So less super smart pair programmer that's going to replace me and more Iron Man suit that's going to let me jump higher and beat up bad guys. I know that was a big kind of a lecture there, but there's a balance between old man who shakes fist at cloud, like, oh, calculators are going to rot their brains. Like I was there when the graphing calculators came out, right? I was there when the non-graphing calculators came out. Like I remember, I remember when we got IntelliSense and they were like, oh, you, you, you type and it goes dot and it popped. And I, oh, my God, you're, you, your brain is going to rot and, and spell check. Oh, my God, spell check, right? It's crazy. It's going to be a weird in couple of years. So I'm excited, but you've got to know what you're doing. So driving stick shift matters still. I don't know if it'll matter later. I do think it's going to change how we talk to stuff. We're going to be able to say, hey, Windows, take this folder and resize all those JPEGs and email them to my wife and zip them up and not ever touch the computer. And it'll do that because it's a pretty typical thing people would want to do. But I think that for really creative work, stuff that's never happened before, you're going to hit right up against limitations. Plus, I worry about in 20 years, if everything is then generated, we are not going to have anything to train it on. So if creative work isn't happening, then how is it ever going to grow? End of speech. Sorry about that. I'm a little salty about the AI thing right now. It's, uh, it's easy for me to to think about um, how I it might affect me in my work. and uh, But I like to try and think about how it might affect other people in their work, um, like other engineers, yeah. other developers. And even though I'm excited about uh, Copilot X, I'm really excited about seeing chat GPT or GPT-4 integrated into Office because mm. often I don't feel as productive in Office as I do in my editor. And so yeah. I look at that as a way to make me more effective in these tools that um, maybe aren't as familiar to me. And so yeah. then I think about, okay, there's a new developer, they're coming into software development and they've been presented with all these tools and they're kind of overwhelmed. And yeah. kind of like I am in Office tools. And then they yeah. get something like Copilot X and they suddenly feel capable and productive in their tools and maybe you know levels them up or at least makes them feel as enabled and empowered as I do using these things. The thing I want to separate is the generative part of AI which is confident BSing and generates oh it passed it passed the you know passed the bar okay it you know it got an 80 right it passed the bar because someone had passed the bar before and it trained on that you know it passed it got an a on uh, on the sat it can write an average uh, five paragraph eighth grade english test you know i'm raising two boys uh they're 15 and, and, and 17. i don't want it to make us lazy i want it to make us better right and i know that that sounds like an old man who's like oh the calculators you never you'll never know math they know math differently than we do. They, they don't keep a running total as they walk in Kroger and buy stuff. And I do. And I know. And I live within 10 cents at the end. Those days are over, right? No one appreciates that, that party trick anymore. 20% on a tip, that's not hard math. They can't do that. That's unfortunate. But um, will it allow a junior dev to get excited about computers faster? Will it make, them, will it make the toil go away? I want to make the boring toil ugh, yak shaving oh, I got to shave this yak before I can make the website, you know, run. That part I want to have go away. An another example I give is, um, I, uh, I don't know how old you are, Sean, but you've got a fresh face, but I've, uh, I've been coding for 32 years and I have a three-page resume. Page two of my resume is scaling web farms. We used to fly consultants in and they would, we would plug in, you know, F5 load balancers and create web farms. You know, we like, we, created new algorithms for correct web farm scaling. And that's a checkbox in Azure. So now I have a two-page resume. 
just happens to have only odd numbered pages, page one and page three, because page two is a checkbox. So I can be sad about that, or I can be excited that that boring part of waiting for the web farm to scale, and now the 20-year-old on my team can be like, oh, this web farm is like taking a minute. Blah. But I'm like, you know, I can be mad about that, or I can be like, that's awesome, because the fun part's making the HTML, and the fun part's making the graphics and stuff. What I don't like is generative examples. I saw an example today that I really did not like that was like, you want to write a, a paper on the American Revolution, and you go, blah, 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 blah. And then like a 40 page paper in the American Revolution with PowerPoint and everything pops out. And you've learned jack squat about history. Generative, don't like. But the ability to actually move a graphic in Word without it leaping off the screen would be amazing, right? You know, like you move a pixel, one pixel, and then the graphic just disappears. Or like telling it, I want these all black and white without having to right click format picture. That's fun. Generative, eh creeps me out. I don't like it. Thank you I for giving me the opportunity to vent. If there are college students who are using these tools to write their history paper for them, then they are guaranteeing that they will be replaced by the tool because they aren't well, learning so, anything and, and they're not contributing to yeah. it. But if they're using the tool to help them write a better paper or to have some uh, insight about something in history, then I think that they'll have something to do you know, once they finish school. Um, I interviewed a gentleman on the podcast recently, John Warner, who wrote a book called Why They Can't Write. And he talks about the, the creation of the five paragraph essay and why young people's writing abilities have, have gone away and what it means. And then in, how do you teach writing at the eighth grade level, at the senior level and at the college level in a world where ChatGPT exists. And you should check it out. He's got a, a, an actual book on this. He's got a workshop. If you or your school district or you have a teacher in your life is interested in that, Why They Can't Write is the original book. And he's doing a workshop now on, um, and I'm gonna be speaking to the school board about, okay, we know this thing exists. We can detect it and start slapping kids, or we can say, all right, this is gonna generate average text. Let's turn that into amazing text and use it as a, as a, as a, as a learning tool. So yeah, or just out. interrogate them on what they wrote theoretically. <laughs> well, um, synthesizing information is going to be really important. Reading at speed. If we're going to start generating a bunch of crap, being able to read it and say, I don't think that's a thing, because you've seen Bing and ChatGPT will hallucinate tweets, things that didn't exist. Um, I asked it to write me a Wikipedia page. Uh, the first five paragraphs were perfect. Then I started inventing dogs, kids, ex-wives. None of those things exist. Uh, so hallucination is going to be a thing we need to teach teach people. Uh, you Google for something and you're like, I don't feel like that website is very um, uh, is, is is very trustworthy. I'm I'm in, a, I'm in a bad neighborhood on the internet. The problem is now we'll be at Bing or Google, which we trust, and it's going to say confident BS. And then we're going to have to be able to say, I don't feel comfortable. But if we anthropomorphize the AI and we convince ourselves that it's a person, which it's not, then that's going to make it really hard. And we love to anthropomorphize stuff. Like the Pixar lamp, we all think that's a real thing because it turned its head and it looked at us. It's not a person. And Scott, just real quick. Um, so let's say we have a .NET 6, a .NET Core 6 application, um, what would be reasons why we would want to consider updating it to, say, .NET 7 or .NET 8 once that's um, available? If, it's, if you're going from 6 to 8, it would be because it's uh, long-term support to long-term support. So you would get yeah. perf for free. You'd get better container support for free. You get AOT if you chose to get it. And you'd be maintaining your long-term support. So for half a week's work or maybe a weekend, depending on the complexity of your app, you're going to get 20% perf gains, more compatibility, ton of bug fixes, and another three years of support. That's a good reason. Mm -hmm. That's why what Bing about did. seven? I, you know, seven, you get some AOT, depends on the app. Then I would say to myself, is it a microservices app? Is it a Kubernetes app? If it's just a regular old web app, you know, I would just start testing on eight now mm. and be ready for November. Okay. Yeah. 
I mean, like the point is have the infrastructure that even like a branch, make a .NET 7 branch, see if it's a big deal or not. Free, it's just free perf. It's just going to get better and better. Chris has a good point there in the, uh, in the chat. Uh, I guess my question is, I haven't been keeping up with the new like C sharp versions very much. Um, I know they introduced uh, interfaces with uh, default methods a while back. Yeah, C sharp um, eleven we're on right now. Okay, and that was eight, I think. Um, do you know if there's like other really big major runtime affecting changes like that in the pipeline? Uh, I think it was six and seven were tiered compilation, which means your jitted code just gets faster the longer it runs. Okay. This is a really clever thing. Typically, you just jitted the entire assembly. Now we jit functions one at a time. But people were oh. like, well, it's taking too long to start up because you're compiling my function. So if I'm chilling, I'm chilling, I'm chilling, and then I call an unfamiliar function. Oh, pause. Jitted. Okay, now mm -hmm. that's going to be like a pause, right? So what we do is we jit it super fast. Then we give you the super fast jitted version, and you keep calling it. And then we'll go, you know, I think I could do that better if I did another draft. And we'll jit it. Oh, it a gives couple another times. opportunity. Okay. And then we'll change the function pointer to go use that one now. And it just gets faster the longer it runs. So long, oh. steady state. It's called tiered JIT compilation. Even numbers, DJH, are the LTS versions. Cool. I have to get going. I realized that I've been going for 90 minutes and I have a meeting. I thought that I was pretty good. What do you think? Is that okay? I thought that was okay. Yeah? Cool. Very well done. Good Much appreciated, Scott. I appreciate that. Um, I am getting really, really deep into this stuff, um, and I am trying to look at it through a uh, uh, non-biased and, and, and um, I think I'm not non-biased. I'm trying to look at it through the lens of my own biases, which are largely age-based and generational around these things with an open eye. So I'm going to be having folks on the podcast that know about AI. I would encourage you to check it out. I've got some really interesting guests, many with PhDs that are thinking about this stuff. The John Warner show. Um, uh, there's also the collection, the, the note, the idea of collecting information about people and then applying AI to it. I had a lady on recently about the, qu the quantified worker because I received these blood sugar strips in the mail. And I'm like, oh, this is great because blood sugar strips are super expensive. They're a buck a piece. They're free. But I have to connect the blood sugar meter to the cloud so that they can see my blood sugar. And then they send it to the insurance company. So then I'm like, Ooh. So imagine a world where your happy, friendly AI is like, hey, Eli, looks like you didn't go for a walk after dinner yesterday. Your blood sugar is a little high. I think your employer is not going to appreciate that. Oh, and you should smile more. <laughs> Right, like that's all possible technically now, and that's not okay. So please do check those things out. I also have transcripts that are searchable, AI generated. Uh, so if there's a topic you're interested, in, please do check them out. So uh, really thinking about this uh, AI space right now. Thank you for subscribing. Excellent, and thank you for joining us again, and uh, look forward to having you uh, hopefully same time next year. All right, catch you later, y'all. Bye bye. All right. Thank you. Take care, Scott. All right, folks, before we leave, just have a couple wrap up uh, slides. So uh, if I may, let me go ahead and share my screen real quick. And in addition, I just pasted a variety of links in the chat window that we'll be covering in just a second. And it's going to take just a moment to share my other screen. And there we go. All right. So um, what I pasted in the chat are several links to resources. Uh, the, uh, the link to the YouTube channel where the uh, presentation will be edited and uploaded in just a couple days. Um, also, I ask you to subscribe to the channel to get upload notifications. Uh, in addition, we're going to be discussing tech events that are coming up in the next month, and those are going to be posted on my blog. And again, you can subscribe to that to get updates. And last but not least, if you would please take a moment to fill out the eval form. So you can provide some constructive criticism back to Scott, as well as put you in the drawing for some of the raffle prizes from uh, both Sharp and, and DevExpress. For those that joined us after the start of the meeting, the special offer from Manning.com, 35% off on a selection of books with the link, uh, pay, excuse me, 
with the link posted in the chat window along with the discount code. And as always, we always like to discuss upcoming events. So on April 4th, which is the first Tuesday of the month, is the Ohio North Database Training Group, and they cover primarily topics related to SQL Server. Chances are, if you work in the .NET realm, you're also working with some sort of a database, uh, probably SQL Server. So uh, a lot of their topics will pertain to a lot of things that we work with. Uh, on the second Wednesday of the month, April 12th, is the Azure Cleveland User Group. And on the third Thursday of the month is the Great Lakes User Group coming from the uh, Okemos, Michigan, and they're going to be virtual. And it's going to be their 20th anniversary meeting, and Carl Franklin will be there to present. So I encourage you all to attend, and all these links will be posted on my blog uh, in just a bit. And then uh, on April 27th, which is the fourth Thursday, is the April meeting of this group, uh, the Cleveland C Sharp User Group, and uh, the, the speaker and information will be posted on the Meetup site. With regards to conferences, on May 5th is Stir Trek. It's going to be happening in Columbus, and um, our tickets are on sale. On May 11th through the 13th is the Global Azure Day. Well, not day, but week, rather. Uh, it's uh, four days of uh, Azure-related topics. And it's going to be online, free of charge, and practically running 24 hours for those four days. So uh, I encourage you to sign up for that. Another thing we always like to do is discuss job openings. You can find job openings available on techsystems.com slash IT dash jobs, but also like to ask who's hiring and who's looking for work. Uh, if you would please make yourself known either in chat or verbally, if you're if you fall into either of those two categories. And the next thing is my contact information. Uh, if you have any questions after the meeting, uh, my email is snasser at nistechnologies.com. You can also find me on Twitter. Uh, the link to my blog is samnasser.blogspot.com. And if we're not connected on LinkedIn, I invite you to do so. And so with that, uh, thank you all for attending and look forward to seeing you all next month. Good night, everyone.